So um, now we've come to the presentation of this year's Klein Lecturer. And uh, the lecturer is Stephen Hawking, Professor Stephen Hawking from Cambridge University, England. And uh, I could talk a long time about his contributions, but I want to be brief and just mention that uh, he has uh, investigated and, and uh, shown how matter and uh, space and time behaves under extreme gravitational circumstances and uh, how, how uh, the concept of time and space breaks down. This is usually hidden uh, behind the horizon in a black hole, but he has also discussed and shown us how the black hole eventually evaporates, evaporates through the Hawking radiation. So these are a few of his uh, scientific contributions. He has also written a number of popular books. And in this respect, both in that he's interested in cosmology and that he's interested in, in popularizing science, he uh, is the perfect Klein lecturer. This, this agrees very well with Oscar Klein's interests. So. Um, the title of his Klein lecture will be uh, Can Fundamental Theory Predict the Universe? So uh, please, Professor Hawking, and Professor Hawking is assisted by one of his graduate students, Tom Pelly. Can you hear me? In this talk, I want to ask, why is the universe the way it is? Does string theory, or M theory, predict the distinctive features of our universe, like a four-dimensional expanding universe with small fluctuations, and the standard model of particle physics? Most physicists would like to believe string theory uniquely predicts the universe because they don't like the alternatives. One is, the initial state of the universe is prescribed by an outside agency, codenamed God. Another is, the anthropic principle. There are many universes, and our universe is picked out by being one of the few to contain intelligent life.
The SETI project is now searching for this intelligent life. Let's hope they have more success than the Eric survey group, because there's no intelligent life on Earth. The usual approach in physics could be described as building from the bottom up. That is, one assumes some initial state for a system and evolves it forward in time with the Hamiltonian and the Schrodinger equation. This approach is appropriate for lab experiments like particle scattering, where one can prepare the initial state and measure the final state. The bottom-up approach is more of a problem in cosmology, however, because we do not know what the initial state of the universe was, and we certainly can't try out different initial states and see what kinds of universe they produce. Different physicists react to this difficulty in different ways. Some, generally those brought up in the particle physics tradition, just ignore the problem. They feel the task of physics is to predict what happens in the lab, and they are convinced that string theory, or M theory, can do this. All they think remains to be done is to identify a solution of M-theory, a Calabi-Yorgi 2 manifold, that will give the standard model as an effective theory in four dimensions. But they have no idea why the universe should be four-dimensional and have the standard model with the values of its 20 plus parameters that we observe. How can anyone believe that something so messy is the unique prediction of string theory? It amazes me that people can have such blinkered vision that they can concentrate just on the final state of the universe and not ask how and why it got there. It is difficult to answer this because the bottom-up approach to cosmology is basically classical and assumes that the universe began in a way that was well-defined and unique. But one of the first acts of my research career was to show with Roger Penrose that any reasonable classical cosmological solution has a singularity in the past. This implies that the origin of the universe was a quantum event. This means that it should be described by the Feynman sum over histories. The universe doesn't have just a single history, but every possible history, each with its own probability. There will be a history in which Saddam Hussein won the Iraq war, though maybe the probability is low. (laughs) 
Some people make a great mystery of the multi-universe, or the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory, but to me, these are just different expressions of the Feynman sum over histories. One can use the sum over histories to calculate the quantum amplitudes for observables at the present time. The wave function of the universe is the amplitude for the metric the present time. It is given by a sum over all histories that end up in the present state. Normally, one thinks of the sum over histories as having two boundaries, an initial surface and a final surface. This would be appropriate in a proper quantum treatment of a pre-Big Bang scenario, like the Ecterotic Universe. In this case, the initial surface would be in the infinite past. But there are two big objections to the sum over histories for the universe having an initial surface. The first is the key question. What was the initial state of the universe and why was it like that? As I said earlier, there doesn't seem to be a natural choice for the initial state. It can't be flat space. That would remain flat space. The second objection is equally fundamental. In most models, the quantum state on the final surface will be independent of the state on the initial surface. This is because there will be metrics in which the initial surface is in one universe and the final surface in a separate disconnected universe. They correspond to the quantum annihilation of one universe and the quantum creation of another. This would not be possible if there were something that was conserved that propagated from the initial surface to the final surface. But the trend in cosmology in recent years has been to claim that the universe has no conserved quantities. Things like baryon number, are supposed to have been created by grand unified or electroweak theories and CP violation. So there is no way one can rule out the final surface from belonging to a different universe to the initial surface. In fact, because there are so many different possible universes, they will dominate and the final state will be independent of the initial. It will be given by a path integral over all metrics whose only boundary is the final surface. In other words, it is the so-called no-boundary quantum state that Hartle and I proposed. If one accepts that the no-boundary proposal is the natural prescription for the quantum state of the universe, one is led to a profoundly different view of cosmology and the relation between cause and effect.
one shouldn't follow the history of the universe from the bottom up, because that assumes there's a single history with a well-defined starting point in evolution. Instead, one should trace the histories from the top down, in other words, backwards from the measurement surface, as at the present time. The histories that contribute to the path integral don't have an independent existence, but depend on the amplitude that is being measured. As an example of this, consider the apparent dimension of the universe. The usual idea is that space-time is a four-dimensional nearly flat metric across a small six- or seven-dimensional internal space. But why aren't there more large dimensions? Why are any dimensions compactified? There are good reasons to think that life is possible only in four dimensions, but most physicists are very reluctant to appeal to the anthropic principle. They would rather believe that there is some mechanism that causes all but four of the dimensions to compactify spontaneously. Alternatively, maybe all dimensions started small, but for some reason, four dimensions expanded, and the rest did not. I am sorry to disappoint these hopes, but I don't think there is a dynamical reason for the universe to appear four-dimensional. Instead, the no-boundary proposal predicts a quantum amplitude for every number of large spatial dimensions, from zero to ten. There will be an amplitude for the universe to be eleven-dimensional Minkowski space, i.e., ten large spatial dimensions. However, the value of this amplitude is of no significance because we do not live in 11 dimensions. We are not asking for the probabilities of various dimensions for the universe. As long as the amplitude for three large spatial dimensions is not exactly zero, it doesn't matter how small it is compared to other numbers of dimensions. We live in a universe that appears four-dimensional, so we are interested only in amplitudes for surfaces with three large dimensions. This may sound like the anthropic principle argument that the reason we observe the universe to be four-dimensional is that life is possible only in four dimensions. But the argument here is different because it doesn't depend on whether four dimensions is the only arena for life. Rather, it is that the probability distribution over dimensions is irrelevant, because we have already measured that we are in four dimensions. The situation with the low-energy effective theory of particle interactions is similar. Many physicists believe that string theory will uniquely predict the standard model and the values of its 40 or so parameters. The bottom-up picture would be that the universe would begin with some grand unified symmetry, like E8 cross E8. As the universe expanded and cooled, the symmetry would break to the standard model, maybe through intermediate stages. The hope would be that string theory would predict the pattern of breaking, the mass, couplings, and mixing angles.
Personally, I find it difficult to believe that the standard model is the unique prediction of fundamental theory. It is so ugly, and the mixing angles, etc., seem accidental rather than part of a grand design. In string stroke M theory, low energy particle physics is determined by the internal space. It is well known that M theory has solutions with many different internal spaces. If one builds the history of the universe from the bottom up, there is no reason it should end up with the internal space for the standard model. However, if one asks for the amplitude for a space-like surface with a given internal space, one is interested only in those histories which end with that internal space. One therefore has to trace the histories from the top down, backwards from the final surface. One can calculate the amplitude for the internal space of the standard model on the basis of the no-boundary proposal. As with the dimension, it doesn't matter how small this amplitude is relative to other possibilities. It would be like asking for the amplitude that I am Chinese. I know I am British, even though there are more Chinese. Similarly, we know the low energy theory is the standard model, even though other theories may have a larger amplitude. <coughs> Although the relative amplitudes for radically different geometries don't matter, those for neighboring geometries are important. For example, the fluctuations in the microwave background correspond to differences in the amplitudes for space-like surfaces that are small perturbations of flat free space across the internal space. It is a robust prediction of inflation that the fluctuations are Gaussian and nearly scale independent. This has been confirmed by the recent observations by the MAP satellite. However, the predicted amplitude is model dependent. The parameters of the standard model will be determined by the moduli of the internal space. Because they are moduli at the classical level, their amplitudes will have a fairly flat distribution. This means that M theory cannot predict the parameters of the standard model. Obviously, the values of the parameters we measure must be compatible with the development of life. I hesitate to say, with intelligent life. But within the anthropically allowed range, 
the parameters can have any values. So much for string theory, predicting the fine structure constant. However, although the theory cannot predict the value of the fine structure constant, it will predict it should have spatial variations, like the microwave background. This would be an observational test of our ideas of M-theory compactification. How can one get a non-zero amplitude for the present state of the universe if, as I claim, the metrics in the sum over histories have no boundary apart from the surface at the present time? I can't claim to have the definitive answer, but one possibility would be if the four-dimensional part of the metric was an inflating universe at early times. Hartle and I have shown that such a universe can be spontaneously created out of nothing. The metric that describes this creation is rounded off in the past without a beginning. Thus these metrics have a boundary only only on the final surface. They can give a non-zero value for almost any amplitude that can come from inflation. It is, for example, not that the universe necessarily started with a grand unified symmetry, which then broke to the standard model. Instead, the universe can have the standard model from the beginning. In conclusion, the bottom-up approach to cosmology would be appropriate if one knew that the universe was set going in a particular way in either the finite or infinite past. However, in the absence of such knowledge, it is better to work from the top down by tracing backwards from the final surface the histories that contribute to the path integral. This means that the histories of the universe depend on what is being measured, contrary to the usual idea that the universe has an objective, observer-independent history. The Feynman sum allows every possible history for the universe, and the observation selects out the subclass of histories that have the property that is being observed. There are histories in which the universe eternally inflates, or is 11-dimensional, but they do not contribute to the amplitudes we measure. I would call this the selection principle, rather than the anthropic principle because it doesn't depend on intelligent life. Life may after all be possible in 11 dimensions, but we know we live in four. The results are disappointing for those who hoped that the ultimate theory would predict everyday physics. We cannot predict discrete features like the number of large dimensions, 
or the gauge symmetry of the low energy theory. Rather, we use them to select which histories contribute to the sum. The situation is better with continuous quantities, like the temperature of the cosmic microwave background, or the parameters of the standard model. We cannot measure their probability distributions, because we have only one value for each quantity. We can't tell whether the universe was likely to have the values we observe, or whether it was just a lucky chance. However, it is noteworthy that the parameters we measure seem to lie in the interior of the anthropically allowed range, rather than at one end. This suggests that the probability distribution is fairly flat, not like the exponential dependence on the density parameter, omega, in the open inflation model that Neil Turok and I proposed. In that model, omega would have had the minimum value required to form a single galaxy, which is all that is anthropically necessary. All the other galaxies which we see are unnecessary. Although the theory cannot predict the average values of these quantities, it will predict that there will be spatial variations, like the fluctuations in the microwave background. However, the size of these variations will probably depend on modular parameters that we can't predict. So even when we understand the ultimate theory, it won't tell us much about how the universe began. It cannot predict the dimension of space-time, the gauge group, or other parameters of the low-energy effective theory. On the other hand, the theory will predict that the total energy density will be exactly the critical density, though it won't determine how this energy is divided between conventional matter and dark matter. The theory will also predict a nearly scale-free spectrum of fluctuations, but it won't determine the amplitude. So to come back to the question with which I began this talk. Does string theory predict the state of the universe? The answer is that it does not. It allows a vast landscape of possible universes in which we occupy an anthropically permitted location. But I feel we could have selected a better neighborhood. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this interesting Klein lecture, Professor Hawking. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, I um, call upon the uh, Minister of 
education to uh, come on, on stage and give Professor Hawking this year's Klein Medal. Please. this award. It is an honor to receive it. The conference was stimulating, and it has been a great pleasure to address you here this afternoon. This concludes the lectures and the Klein lecture for this year, and I hope to see you all back next year for next year's Klein lecture. Thank you all for listening, and thank all the participants. Det blir nu en presskonferens från scenen, så representanter från media är välkomna fram. There will be a short press conference on the stage. We please welcome representatives from the media. Thank you. Inte bara då som händer ut på skärn himlen, så finns det en sådär minsta. Okej, jag tror att det finns en sådär. Human science can find out about human beings. Is there a member to what we might know? Like how galaxies and stars are born, why do the fundamental constants have the values that they have? Is there life in our system? If you would speculate, what do you think is the nature of the dark energy that we think is responsible for the, for the inflation phase of the universe right now? I think quantum corrections to the geometry of the universe. There have been a lot of work and progress in string theory and similar ideas. Yes. Why are these theories of the smallest things important for cosmology and the theory of the whole universe? <laughs> because the universe became very small. <laughs> good answer, good answer. Finally, you have devoted I mean, much of your life, much of your time to fundamental physics and cosmology. Why? Because I enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Would you like to keep the scrum